like to begin? Well, perhaps we can begin at the um, message you sent me about this this doctor, the book. Yeah. All that I I sent you is that. Uh, I think is irrelevant from the comment you mentioned. I sent it to you uh, because uh, it seems that uh, the mind is locked into the idea that um, the thoughts uh, or the mind is required a brain. And um, that the mind does not continue without a physical form and the truth of the matter it doesn't really matter because um, at least what the knowledge is pointing is uh, being liberated from identification with the body and the mind and that's what matters so it's not it's less important the philosophical discussion whether the mind can exist without a physical form or not it's more of what is the experience on a daily life when you identify or anybody identifies with their ideas and beliefs do they feel tension and fear and stress or do they experience an unchanging peace within them that is not affected by anything no matter what happens because that's what transform one's life, not the understanding whether the mind continues without a body or exists when there's no brain and so forth. I thought that you might find it interested, interesting and that's why I sent you the name of the book. I glanced at the book because somebody gave it to me and all I saw that uh, it was still all a projection of the mind being lost in a dream just on a subtle dream that's all nothing to do with the physical form and we can see that as a human being we go through the three states of waking state dreaming state and deep sleep state which it's the waking state is a gross body the dreaming state is a subtle body and the deep sleep state is a causal body so he was referring to a subtle body wandering and traveling in different worlds and seeing different entities on the subtle just like in a dream without any connection to the brain because something was happening to his brain that's all you've taken my arguments away um, for me uh, the book which I have read and, and you know he's been uh, certainly in the medical community quite a controversy because um, it's, it's, it's certainly well established and I know you don't want to dwell on the factual elements of, of what happens um, neurologically in a brain that's either dying or a brain that's demented or a brain that has Alzheimer's disease or a brain that has a stroke, but it it it, <coughs> it forms the basis of perhaps not a philosophical argument, but but, but a but a rational phenomenological perspective, which I can't seem to erase um, because the basis of my thinking um, from my day-to-day -day clinical experience is that we're simply biological robots, you know, that, 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 that um, it's increasingly understood the philosophical approach where everything is an illusion is quite correct from a biological perspective as well. You know, there is the illusion of, of, of seeing, there is the illusion of hearing. Sometimes you block out things, sometimes you don't see things that are there. There is the illusion of knowledge, there is the illusion of, of um, cause and effect, and, and increasingly we, are, we, we realize the, the tricks that the mind plays. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a biological phenomenon. And I, 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 your, your point of view that, that um, 
one must rest the mind or remove oneself from the shackles of the mind leads the quest leads to the question who is it that is unshackling um, because there's still a, there's still a reporter there's still a witness there's, a, there's still something that is reporting an awakened or an enlightened or uh, an illumined mind there, there's still somebody that witnesses you know I, I've listened to some of the conversations um, with some of the others and, and, and people who claim to have had an awakening I mean it, it, uh, from a philosophical perspective it says well who's the person that's had the awakening because there's always an I perspective in all of this and uh, from again uh, forgive me for, for, for being very biological um, the, the, the idea of consciousness uh, itself is an illusion um, biologically because we know that there's no particular part of the brain that subserves consciousness it's 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 uh, a meshwork of neurons that create this eye phenomenon, which we see deteriorate uh, biologically in disease states. You know, you, you'll have, I, I, we, we talked about it on the Skype briefly on texting, that, you know, I, 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 I can have a patient today who is uh, articulate, intelligent, educated, and is able to converse like you and I, and within 24 hours, um, something happens within the structure of the brain. And all of the, the, the higher function activities, insight, phil philosophical dialogue, um, uh, orientation, awareness, all disappear at the same time. And if that is the case, it sort of translates, in, in my understanding, that, that this is just a biological phenomenon. In terms of consciousness, what's important is that do you experience even for a moment or right now, an awareness that is just silent within you, that has no thoughts? No, because the moment you, 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 you attempt to seek, the moment I attempt to seek that, there is a witness to it, which is the brain trying to to say, let's step back and see if there's no thought. That in itself is a thought. And afterwards, after that question completes itself, thought appear. We have one thought at a time. You recognize that? Yes. So a thought appears, complete itself, disappear. Another thought appears, complete itself, like frames moving really quickly. Yes. Yes. If if one do to practice start to cut the frames what happens the speed goes down and when the thought appears completes itself and disappears if there's no other thought arises what remains is ordinary silence which i would say it's ordinary because it's everyone's nature yet it's extraordinary it's actually grace itself if there is the recognition of this silent silence or silent awareness and the mind can fix the attention on that awareness then you start to experience experience eternal peace so maybe for someone like you just to begin to experience this glimpse of peace and the more you are drawn to this peace then something opens and the only thing that creates the illusion that there is no peace is because there is so much identification with the ideas and the beliefs that it it's like a cloudy clouds that are thick then the sign doesn't shine through it depends what you want what, do you know what you want you it seems like you're interested in in knowing who you truly are or knowledge about the self do are you seeking peace and um, or are you looking to 
understand. There's a difference between the two. Peace is an experience. Understanding is of the mind. Um, well, they're both words, uh, and they both have definitions, uh, so they both arise from the mind. Um, let, let me stop you for a second. Let's examine that, yeah? Whether it's from the mind or not, do you have occasions that you just stop and you experience just something, you experience silence, glimpses of yes. that. Yes, yes. It, it's an experience or you imagine it? It's an experience, but it's, it's, it's a state. It's a state of the mind. Let's, let's keep it that it is a state of the mind. Would you be interested of more of that state of mind? Or less, because in the Buddhism sometimes they call it um, um, that the self or this peace is a state of mind for a beginner seeker. So they won't have any conflict. So, or they call it mindfulness. That the mind is full of illumination, full of peace, full of silence or full of presence it's just words that are pointing to the experience and in the experience words cannot enter it's just an experience and then the mind comes back and interpret the experience mentally with thoughts and words yes sure okay so i bring back the question what is interests you what is your yearning and calling is it for this whatever peace, joy, happiness that is experienced or the understanding and philosophy about it? Because in the philosophy there would be arguments about it. In the experience there won't be any thought that argues. There would be just the peace that everyone is looking for, the happiness that everyone is looking for the joy that everyone is looking for, the silence that everyone is looking for? I guess the answer to that um, is, uh, for me, that they're, they're, they're intertwined. Um, I, I, I can't tease out or dissect away my yearning to understand who I am. At the same time, with today's frontiers in medicine, it constantly draws me back to the findings of the neuroscientists and the neurophysiologists about how the brain functions and how the brain behaves in a very similar manner to which Buddhist philosophy espouses, that everything is an illusion and that your mind deludes you or eludes you into perceiving things that are not really there. And the proximity of where science meets philosophy intrigues me because with today's imaging technology, for example, um, we're beginning to understand the way the mind um, deceives itself. What, what I am trying to extract from our conversations as well as from my reading, which you've introduced me to, is, is there really something beyond the mind and the brain, which you, 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 you um, uh, espouse, or is it simply a product that the mind is generating to satisfy itself that there is something beyond the mind? Now, again, I, perhaps I've answered my, your question in a very circuitous manner. Um, that uh, my yearning is to understand what is it that I am. Um, because uh, as a physician, um, and as you've already said, sometimes experiences are, are illusory. They're, they're projections of the mind. And you may have an experience, but it's an entirely illusory experience. Um, <clears throat> one can create through drugs, one can create, create through electrode stimulation in the brain. Um, 
colleagues of mine are, are, are working on areas of memory where you can insert a probe and, and you, 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 you uh, send an electric current in a particular part of the memory structure and memories that you never thought you had lost all come back your experience as a two-year-old or your three-year-old, the smells and the sounds and what have you. Now, th that tells me um, that a lot of the things that we create in our mind are illusory and, 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 and biological phenomena. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm digging myself into a grave here, but, but, but um, do, do you get my, my... Yes, I agree that all the thoughts that the mind is creating is an illusory. One thing that one has to come to see, and they would come to see whenever they do, is that the experience of awareness does not satisfy the mind. Because the mind dies into that awareness, dies from its identification with the body and the mind. The mind doesn't want to rest into awareness. It is addicted to get attached to thought and get lost in the illusion of the world, in the illusion of the thoughts, like dreaming. So the mind is not satisfied from awareness. It's like the more enlightened the being it is, the less I, thoughts or the less of the world they have. So the more you lose the world, the more enlightened you are. So it doesn't satisfy the mind. The mind has to give up its ideas and beliefs. And that the mind that is driven by its identity from it doesn't want to. It's not, a, it's not an easy task for the mind to rest in the self. Don't misunderstand. It's the contrary. It's the mo It's so rare. And it's... Um, the mind can rest in awareness and there's a recognition and the next moment there's a forgetfulness and then you, the mind identify with its ideas and believe to be real and get lost and just in the world of illusion. So... Awareness doesn't satisfy the mind. And the mind can never be satisfied from any objects of the world. What happens is that when the mind rests and dissolves into awareness, that the conditioning, the habits, what they call vasanas, dissolve, then what remains is eternal peace and there's no one to enjoy it. Because this eternal peace is you. I don't know if you read Ramana Maharshi, any of his material, the books or anything. You read any? Yes. And there's another guy, Anamalai Swami, that he talks about final talks. It's a nice book. And uh, mm, take a look again at the non-dual non -dual reality. I don't know if you read it or not. No. Mm. even there he talks about the superimposition and the first veiling and he says the veiling of the mind is of two kinds I can read you the first he talks about in the veiling and this is the book the non-dual non-dual the lamp of non-dual knowledge yes um, and he talked, the first uh, topic he's speaking about is superimposition. Superimposition in a simple way, we superimpose attributes on objects that the objects don't even have. So I, I buy a car, I'm happy. Somebody steals the car, I'm unhappy. I superimpose the happiness or unhappiness on the piece of metal and plastic that doesn't have happiness or unhappiness. That's a form of, of superimposition. Simple way. Yeah, ho ho hold that thought. Just hold that thought. That, that, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. But one doesn't need the depths. I, I haven't read the book, but, but, but just coming at it 
from uh, from from a purely biological perspective is what I'm saying that, that we understand the same thing biologically that and that attachment that emotion that anger that you know um, we know that uh, you know, I'm a cardiologist that that half of the heart disease that we see is self-imposed by thoughts of stress and that stress comes from a thought you know and, and that drives up your adrenaline and drives up your cortisol and it gives you heart disease and blood pressure and diabetes we know all these things and we know it from a biological perspective that your mind um, the mind tortures itself eventually translating that mental torture into physical into, into physical manifestation okay. one doesn't need to have philosophical insight to understand that today because we now know the, the pathways that result in all of this okay uh, when you're depressed, you eat badly, you smoke, you take alcohol, um, you don't exercise, all, come, all coming from stress. So all of these things are, are clearly understood without philosophy. But it is still the mind that is doing itself, you know, to, to say to oneself, and that's where I'm a little stuck, that, that okay, one steps back and watches this. Neuroscientists are still saying, who is it? Is it the mind deluding itself by creating this sort of super mind that says, okay, let's watch yourself. It's like the, 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 the Freudian, you know, the id and the super id and the super ego. These are all constructs um, by the same neurological process, albeit the higher cerebral cortex that's creating this structure to say, well, watch yourself, see what you did. Look, look at the mess you've got yourself into. Look how tightly your nappy is knotted down. Okay what's wrong about let's assume and i go with that theor theory that it's the mind and then there's the super mind gets it to see all the mess of the lower mind i would say so now we'd say if you open the viveka they they talk about the lower mind and the higher mind lower mind is the ego that identifies with the physical body the higher mind is what they call the buddhi higher intelligence sure. that discriminates and determines the true nature of objects in the mind. So the higher mind has a higher intelligence than the lower mind. The lower mind is actually mm, ego-driven. The higher mind questions the ego. So if it brings, if the higher mind awakens and has brings more clarity into one's life I see it's beneficial sure it is but 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 the, the, the argument that I have and, and it's not an argument the observation that I have is, is is what happens to an individual that can't think what happens to you know where, where is this awareness that one talks about uh, in patients that are demented how, how, how does one have the same conversation about insight and awareness and resting in, in mindfulness in somebody that has a neurocognitive de uh, deficit? There isn't anything. We wouldn't be able to know unless you experience it directly, isn't it? No, that's a cop-out. Um, you know, if, if, if you have a... a it's as it's a simple observation, Alonda, that, that you, you will have somebody today that, um, a, you know, a, 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 an example comes to mind. I, I have a patient who was a professor of physics, and a couple of weeks ago he had uh, a stroke affecting the part of the brain um, uh, that's got to do with higher learning. And today you cannot even have a bear, you can barely construct a sentence and conversation with him. Now one wonders if there is awareness, if there is something beyond the mind and the brain, where is it in this particular individual that there is a it's the conversation fell.